You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show. Considered the hottest podcast in the universe. Now get ready for the heat. Here's Brian Callen. Okay, everybody, this is The Brian Callen Show. And uh, I will be in, um, I'm going to be in uh, Boston this weekend at Laugh Boston doing stand-up comedy. Thursday, January 9th, 10th, and 11th. So come one, come all. Because apparently I'm hilarious. Uh, back by popular demand, I've got Big Mike Callen um, on the podcast. I understand that you've been getting some calls from people who uh, find out where your number is somehow and they they call your phone number and they want to talk <laughs> And you don't really answer back. If you if you get my father's number, he's just not going to call you back. <laughs> well, I don't mean that to be um, arrogant or impolite. And in fact, I am truly flattered. But there's really no way that I can accommodate uh, <laughs> that sort of thing. I mean, I, Hold the mic in front of your face. How many times I got to tell you? Uh, Sorry. It is. I'll give you a slap. Sorry. It is. Um, you know, a dilemma that one would like to interact with people, but it's not practical. We're able to interact with people more and more nowadays with Skype. What do you, I think I was thinking about this. Education now at a good university costs $40,000 a year. And I think what's going to happen in a very short time, and already is happening, is people are just not going to go into debt by two hundred grand or whatever it is they're going to start taking their education online for six grand. I mean, that's kind of what's going on, don't you think? We'll have to see how that works out because there have always been things like correspondence courses, uh, grotesquely inferior to what we have now online. But if you're going to hire someone, especially in a very important job, I'm not going to be around, and I wonder if you're going to be around to see people be indifferent to whether somebody took a course online or were graduated from Harvard. And I think it's all about the control mechanism surrounding the educational experience. Uh, this, what do you mean? Well, you could tell me that you uh, took 85 online courses, and indeed we have this spectacular institution we've mentioned before called the teaching company and in my office right next to where we are now you will see bookshelves full of courses that i've been collecting through the years and in some of those cases i watch them well in one case three times but very often two times and probably get a, a great deal of knowledge out of that but Why how do you, you know that wait right. let me finish yeah, point yeah. how do you know that um Let's take an extreme example to make the point because it applies across the board. You don't um, feel so well and then discover that you need some surgery. Um, somebody says, well, I graduated from Harvard, did my residency in surgery at Mass General Hospital. Another person comes along and says, I couldn't afford to do all that, but I took an online course uh, in, in this kind of surgery and and I don't want you to worry about it. Well, you're going to go Harvard because yeah. Harvard has a control system. and Yeah, that's an extreme uh, example only because obviously there's a mechanical aspect to surgery, practice, all that stuff. But I, I see what you're saying. I mean, there's no question that, that, you know, if you're an athlete, you're going to want to go to college. You're going to want to go to that institution. You're going to want to have the experience of, you know, what it's like to be around a lot of other people and kids and dynamic people. And I don't think online courses and online education can actually substitute for the experience of being around other people from other countries with other ideas that you have to kind of interact with. That's stimulating. That's, that's you, you also want to know, me as someone who employs people or did most of my life, you also want to know how they reacted to um, rather intense pressure yeah. and competition. And yeah. somebody, let's face it, somebody who graduates as a Baker Scholar from the Harvard Business School um, is demonstrating to me their ability to do three case studies a night under a lot of pressure and behave in a very competitive environment uh, in front of a disinterested observer, i.e. the professor, and I was one of those for about 15 years. Um, 
see, to me, to me, there is no question after a semester uh, course who is a more accomplished and more skilled person among my class. And yeah. I usually had about 25 people per. And you can tell class. right away. I could tell at the end of a semester. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel my, the level of reliability was really quite high. Now, I am not confident that we have that ability in the online environment. Right. Because if you're going to take a test, how do I know how many people have... I guess you know, online education will, will serve its purpose to its own end. I mean, and then you'll get a degree, but the question becomes, is that... I mean, really what you want at the end of your education is a good job. Most people do. And most people want a future and a skill set or at least the base for a skill set that's going to give them a better life. See, most corporations and businesses hire somebody out of a good business school because the business school has done one thing, not instilled knowledge and skill. The corporation usually does that over the period of a career, like in my case with Citigroup over 30 years. Um, but they did, they did a screen they did a screen. They, it's a they, vetting they, process. They screened. And, and the people that got into Harvard Business School and excelled while they were there demonstrated something that you can't fool people with. I mean, it's, there's no easy way around it. Um, you spent a lot of time doing strange things. Um, you're learning Ita- Italian. Sorry? Sorry, Sorry about that. You're learning Sorry? Italian and you're taking math. Right. Can you explain to me, and uh, what else are you doing? I think that's it. What uh, Can you explain to me why you're spending all your time taking Italian when you live in Utah? My Italian takes maybe three hours a day. Oh, that's all? Yeah. Interesting. And I, I do it on a, um, mm, what do they call this, a FaceTime basis right now. So you're, you're learning Italian online? Yeah. Well, no, I, there's nothing wrong with being online, especially when you're face-to-face with the teacher. And by the way, Learning a language is not something universities are very good at. Yeah. Right. Um, what they what you find is that online language instruction, which your mother and I are taking, uh, the teacher can is there as a as a controller to uh-huh. say how well are you doing. Not Spanish, you which is uh, you live in the United States, the bilingual. Country. I took you a lot just... of Spanish when I was working in Latin America and yeah and other. Places that your accent is atrocious. An operative language. I'm not. I'm not taking Italian for any reason other than the fact that it's fun. I've always liked the language. Yeah, and it's a it's a good productive use of time. Learning a language has the benefit of permitting you to see every day how much better you can use that language. But your accent seems to be a bit of a hurdle. Uh, I mean, we call that la pronuncia. And la pronuncia. My my my. You 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 fancy yourself. Really terrific at the accent stuff. It's just how I make my living. Uh, right. And uh, for example, no big deal. the I'm other day you overheard my, my Italian lesson. I think I was taking it early in the morning. Yeah. You were downstairs. And you told me uh, that the pronunciation of E eh is not A. Eh. Depends upon which particular A eh or E eh you're using. But you drag out the A. Hey. I mean, you'd really A. Hey. You think your audience wants to hear how well I speak Italian? No, no, no. I'm just... I, I do. I, I do I just, think my my Italian I, pronunciation when I read uh, several pages from a novel for my my teacher or la professoressa is is ten times better than it was a year ago. Well, do you have to shout it? I mean, is it is it a language that you? No, but oh. a lot of people a lot of people think you do have to shout Italian. Now, now can you say something in Italian for us? Can you? Uh, I mean, you just said to me you're a lot better at Italian than you were a year ago. Can you say Vora, that? Uh, vorrei imparare l'italiano perché la famiglia uh, era italiana e perché uh, mi piace molto uh, questa lingua. Well, it's not bad. Well, it's not bad. Did you make that up or is that real Italian? Well, I mean, you're going to get a lot of feedback saying that's probably one of the most... Um, Beautiful things that a lot of people have heard in a long time. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll wait. That's if that's say. the case, please somebody tweet me about his amazing accent. Yeah. Um, why math? Why are you learning math? I mean, I just feel like life mathematics, is too short. Math- mathematics is the queen of the sciences. Um, I spend a lot of my time reading and watching debate. Um, By the way, he's very- retired, so this is he skis, he reads, he watches debate. Go on. And we have... 
and I uh, have found increasingly frustrating uh, the very, very poor logical powers that proponents of various causes use, and I'm starting at the very top of our government, down and throughout and across, and even in everyday life. And so when they're trying to get a point across or argue or position? They, they don't use anything approaching the scientific method. There, there is a thing that drives me crazy and should drive others crazy. We all do it to some extent, but we should keep working through life to minimize it, and it's called selective perception. You, we all have a, a set of assumptions we carry around with us. We, you know, that has to do with religion, how we were brought up, and the things we take for granted. We're not even aware of those anymore, and they drive perceptions. And then, you know, a lot of your perceptions are based on the assumptions that you would need a psychiatrist in some cases to tell you what your assumptions are. It takes some work, and from there comes the perceptions, and then the feelings, anger guilt, whatever they may be, and from that comes the behavior. So if you work your way back through that and you get back all the way to your assumptions, you'll discover that um, a lot of your behavior is based on invalid assumptions. The only way you can do that, though, is to take a scientific, hard science approach to the world around you. And what I mean by that is you gather all the data, not just the data that you find convenient to your position, you gather all the data around you, examine it the way a scientist would, determining whether the law of gravity really works in all environments, and you come out with a conclusion. But people don't do that. Very few people do that. Um, let's take an example of, of that in everyday life. Let's look at the minimum wage issue for a minute. Um, we're having this debate. The way the, debates, the debate is couched as those of you against the rise in the minimum wage are against poor people. You want people to be poor, you bastard. And it's couched in very emotional language and a very emotional base. That is not the case. Um, the minimum wage, if you want people to be better off, instead of making it $10, why, won't, why don't we make it $50 an hour? I and mean, that would seem to solve a lot of the poverty problems. Well, not even the extreme advocates of that, except maybe the extreme socialist who thinks the government should own everything. Put them aside a second, but an advocate of the minimum wage increase would say, no, $50 is too much. Mm -hmm. Well, if $50 is too much, why is that so? Well, because businesses wouldn't exist in that environment. They would go Could out of business. Yeah. Well, if it's, they're going to go out of business at $50, how do we go about, in a scientific way, gathering all the data available, and there's immense amounts of it, to find out what the level is that you're doing more harm than you are good to the very people you're starting, you're trying in, to in help. In other words, because a lot of companies... If you force them to pay people 15 or $20 an hour, they're going to have to hire fewer people. They will hire fewer people, and they'll find a number of different ways to automate the task That's that right. lower-wage people... Um, that can't be lost on people calling for a higher minimum wage. Um, that debate is one that's been going on forever. The preponderance of the evidence um, where you can take political color out of it and that's not always the case, but there is some scientific work that's done on this, will tell you that if you increase the wage that you're required to pay a new employee, you won't hire the new employee. The new employee is already at a level, if he's at minimum wage, he's not very skilled. But it is very important for the employee to be part of a work environment at whatever level they're starting at, and to learn what work and social responsibility in the workplace is all about. I can use myself as a perfect example, but I won't carry on because everybody has their own examples. But in fact, having work and feeling good about how you accomplish those tasks work is called for is not a lot different from you doing a good performance and getting a lot of laughs and a lot of good feedback. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have those needs. Well, also the fact that, that a lot of minimum wage people are starting out with their, that's their first job. 
and they're, exactly and they're moving on to other, you know, it's not like they're staying there. They're working their way up, a lot of people. And the more of a deterrence you put in the way of hiring them as a first-time worker, uh, let's, let's, use, let's use a real quick example here. Your mother and I hire people that do various types of things for us because it's better, it's better for us to let them do that than for us to do it ourselves. Right. If we suddenly had to pay them $20 an hour, we'd do it ourselves. It's very, very clear. Yeah. That's what would happen. And those people that are in this environment around here would not be working. And they need the there. job. They need the money. They need the $10 they need the money. or the $15 or the $12. Of course they hour. need the money. And if they do a good job, I always like to give them a bonus. And I also recommend them to other people. And I've seen uh, significant amounts of progress and advancement among lower skilled people. And I've also seen them. Well, I have provided them with some the wherewithal to get a better education and a higher level of training. Well, uh, I've seen a lot of that in <clears throat> Los Angeles. There are a lot of economies that are their own. The housing, when you want to buy, build a house or you want to decorate your, the inside of your house or renovate the inside of your house, when you want stone cutters and you want uh, painters and you want people who do specialty cabinetry or whatever, that is a very small world that works on reputation, just like, by the way, Hollywood does. Reputation, they don't need the government in there. The reputation and your work and your word and your, your, your past deeds are gold. That's what makes a difference. And so the, the, those economies become their own little things where, where they say, who, do you know a guy who does a good job painting? Yeah, I got a guy. Um, I got an, you know, and, and if you screw pe- enough people over, all of a sudden you can't be that guy. It's well, that's exactly- what Angie's List is all about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just for one sort. Yeah, and that's that's what the nice thing about a, a, a real marketplace. A real marketplace is um, a very interesting living organism in a way because it, it balances itself out. And- See, the income inequality issue which has been raised with great passion is a perfect example of a discussion about our society which is almost entirely dysfunctional because the scientific look at this issue would come up with a very different set of conclusions that our current president is coming up with. Um, first of all, you would look at all of the income, including the government sources of transfer payments, that people on the lower end of the income scale, and that's usually not what people are doing. They're saying they make this amount of money and CEOs make that amount of money. Well, you would expect that to happen in a knowledge industry, which is what we have become as opposed to an industrial economy. Explain, explain that to people. Um, a knowledge industry is where you have all of your value in your society on the skills of very few people, uh, as opposed to an industrial uh, society where the workers on the factory floor and the foreman down there on that floor and the salespeople that sell the product the skill base and the contribution to the ultimate value is not all that different. So if the CEO gets paid 500 times more than the factory worker, that's not sustainable. Unions didn't permit that to happen. Now, you've got a brain tumor, and this is your life. And you go to see the best or somebody who's at least very experienced at these matters using correctly all the current technology with MRIs and so forth. It doesn't matter how much you pay that person because your life is involved. Worse if one of your children has this issue. So it's not a comparison of what he does versus the orderlies in the hospital yeah. or others. You're paying people for their knowledge. And, you're, 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 and everything rides on, the, on their knowledge. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and we've become a knowledge economy, but what does that do then – for what does that do for if it feels though that we have paid a price in our transition from being an industrial economy to a knowledge economy a service economy um because a lot of people are sort of left out of that loop if they don't have the skills or the knowledge and what do we do about that but there have always been people left out of the loop to use your expression yes I mean, that, that's another thing about the debate that goes on. There is a tendency to fantasize the past as opposed to remembering the past. <laughs> and there are a lot of people in the community I'm living in right now 
who are given to doing that. I'm part of a, a mailing list of political argument that goes on and on and on. And there are people that really do believe that we're in terrible shape and headed down the tubes, which couldn't be more ridiculous. And I love this debate because they're forgetting there was a Cold War where we could have been eliminated in a thermonuclear blast for a long time until the end of the 80s, where there were two very powerful, um, highly weaponized entities at loggerheads against each other. The United and, States and the Soviet Union. Yeah, and before that, we had, if you go back far enough, when I was born, we had World War II. We didn't know if we'd all end up speaking Japanese or German. My parents didn't know that. Those were high, high stakes. They, they were everything, the whole thing. They state. were everything. They were all of it, yeah. And now we don't, have, we don't have any. And by the way, we had the Great Depression. People forget about all that. So I hear people talking about, I hear the same kinds of things even though uh, I never had a grandfather that I knew, but I know my great grandfather said exactly what some of these contemporary idiots out here of my uh, generation are saying about the morality has gone to hell, the country is going down. I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. And but I, why? Well, what are they comparing it to? Is there any objective nostalgia? Comparison? Nostalgia, and I think it's a it's a reaction to. Uh, what seems to be an ins- insurmountable problem is a very, very complex society. Very good book called The Myth of America's um, Decline. I think I may have sent you... Uh, I didn't get it. I want to read it. The Myth of America's Decline. The Myth of American Decline. And what it points out is the relative terms, and it uses hard data, in relative terms on a worldwide basis, the United States is as favorably positioned as it's ever been. It still is the best country to be in. That's why so many people come across our border with 12 million. The marketplace tells you something of how attractive the place is. At any given point, people are dissatisfied because they're people. They want better. That's fine. I'm not arguing we have paradise, but I'm arguing a lot of the political rhetoric coming out of Washington is, um, uh, is not very constructive is it leads people down a path that doesn't really exist. I mean, after all, it, and I've already referred on these podcasts to The Rational Optimist by Matt yeah, we Reitman. Had him, we had him on this podcast. Yeah, and I, and I, I listened to that, and I thought he was very good, but his, his point is well taken. Show me why you're so much worse off. Uh, you're not in an well, immediate his, danger of going saying, into the Army and being sent in our harm's way. You're not going to have to bury your child nearly as often as you did even 50 years you ago. You know that we've almost entirely solved childhood cancer. We put a lot of resources into it. No, I did not know that. Hmm? Have we? Yes, yes. Uh, a lot of various kinds of childhood cancer were Leukemia. Fatal. All those type of things were fatal and are now we, we've solved, we're solving 95% of those cases. Jesus. So, um, but there, yeah, well, I don't know. There, there are a lot of cancers that are, cancer is really still a drug, a disease that it's so beguiling and it's just, you know, we still, we're still very, very, um, we're still in a position where a lot of those cancers, there's not much we can do about. They hit you with, there's a chemo per, per, uh, chemotherapy protocol, radiation protocol, and a surgery pro- protocol, but trying to get it, trying to stop it before it's metastasized, trying to deal with it when it has metastasized, uh, when it's gotten into lymph nodes and things, that's really, really dicey. That's still, unfortunately, we're ne- nearly where we should be, I guess. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Well, do you have much doubt that we'll be in a much better position 30 years from now than we are today? No doubt at all. Okay. I mean, I, we're reverse engineering the brain. I mean, that's so much of what they're finding about. And I want to talk to you about this. So much of what they're finding about, um, you know, the, the disease is really that we may very well just be a conduit for information if you can get to the brain and get the brain to shut those signals off. Shut the shut the signal off for to 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 you know when you have irregular cell division, the brain is telling the body to do that. And as we learn more and more about the brain, as we as we there's this huge project now that they're throwing a whole lot of money at, and I think it started in the UK, um, but they're trying to reverse engineer the brain. And and once we learn and can break down really what this brain is, this incredibly vast complex computer. That that's where so many of the answers lie. But what what's interesting about, and I'm getting to a point, uh, 
that I want you to comment on. So much of what um, dealing with life's problems really does require sometimes shaking up the paradigm by which you approach issues. So, so much of, um, uh, there's this tendency to think, well, all we have to do is um, add more of this or take away more of this, um, where in fact, maybe we need to completely restructure the way we think about things. That's what the great innovators do. I'm not given to um, restructuring uh, entirely. I'm an Edmund Burkean conservative, and let me try to explain that as concisely as possible. Burke uh, was the father of conservatism, and there's a very good book I'm reading now about the great debate, it's called, and uh, people always want to know who wrote it, and right now I'm blanking a bit. I probably have been skiing all day too much in the summer. Skiing well, by the way. 73 uh, years old. Thank you. Very good job. Um, I was very impressed. I didn't even, I couldn't believe it was you, to be honest with you. The, the great debate is where the conservative liberal discussions we're having today, which have become so absolutely full of animosity, started. And they started in uh, the early 1800s, basically, where Edmund Burke died in 1797. But uh, his position would be a hard one to argue on the political platform, but his writings were prolific. And what he said was, every time you decide that you are smarter than the collective wisdom of all the generations that came before you, that in human history now you could trace back as much as 50,000 years, but that would be a little silly. Let's just use 2,000 years as an example. Society as it exists today is not something that sprung up out of any one man's idea. That's right. It is something, it's a growing organism, it's changing all the time. And the people that frighten me and would frighten Burke are those who come in, and I think we have a lot of them in Washington and in We've the White House. We've had a lot of history, Mao Zedong. Where, where, they, where they come, they Stalin, come, that's right, Mao Zedong, Hitler. Vladimir Lenin. Um, Stalin, Joseph Stalin, Hitler, yeah. Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Uh, these were people that Pol said Pot. society is sick, it's bad, uh, we've got to restructure the whole thing. Yeah. In order to do that, we have to wipe out just millions of people who are currently part of the bourgeoisie or whatever, whatever class they didn't like. I'm not comparing any of those characters to our modern government. But you still, anybody with the ego and the energy... And those are not negative. Those are positive forces. But you, to go through what you have to go through to become elected to national office in our country today, the amount of money alone, you can't even think, can't even think about running for president of the United States it, unless three years before the election date you have $20 million in the bank. Well, and it's going to cost you, it's going to cost you in today's world, it's going to cost you over $300 million dollars uh, to have a decent shot now. Is that right? Yes. So you need about three hundred thousand dollars, three hundred million dollars, three hundred million dollars. You need to be to actually run for president. And you've got a bunch of hurdles to overcome. So, so why? Well, explain. I mean, I need. Why would I need three hundred million dollars? I, in other words, because I nobody need... knows Brian Callen. He may have best ideas in the world. His family knows him. Maybe thirty thousand people on a podcast know him. How are you going to get? Uh, Mitt Romney lost and 60 million people voted for him. And he first had to get the nomination of a major party, the Republican Party. How, and there are a bunch of other people. When it started, there were about 11 people who had national prominence and, and had a national spotlight shine on them. How are you going to get all your ideas out to 60, in fact, the total electorate was 125 million. How are you going to get all your ideas out to all those people? Do you know how much that costs? Is that, isn't that a bad thing? I don't know. Well, I mean... I mean, talk, that's another thing people seem all settled But talk to me about finance, campaign finance reform. Why is... How do we get money out of politics? I don't want... I don't want my representatives having to spend half their time or 40% of their time, whatever, on the phone with fundraisers. I don't want fundraisers in Washington to have that much power because that's who makes a difference. The shot callers are the fundraisers, man. Yeah, so, on the other hand, so on how the other you, hand. How do you, how do you, how do we deal with that? You yeah, believe those, in those are all a bunch of sound bites that I won't even necessarily disagree with, but I think they need to be examined. 
First of all, there's no one fundraiser. I donate to political campaigns. The amount I am legally allowed to give any one candidate is minuscule relative to what that candidate needs. And I mean that's true for corporations. How much are you allowed to give? Probably, pro- probably gave all together last year 15000 20000 to, uh, let's see, I would guess five different candidates. And... I have I pick one at a state level who I think is really constructive and has a future in national office. In this case, it's Scott Walker, the governor of Wisconsin. And I think he has an uh, opportunity to make maximum impact. So I, I, I sent him money on his recall election and uh, all that type of thing. But, but in the scheme of things, I mean nothing to him, nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing whatsoever. Giving that money is a way of expressing your philosophy in a meaningful way. Yeah, kind of like giving him a charity. <laughs> it's not like there's one guy. I'll, t- I'll tell you, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, who I got to know a little bit in New York when I was the CEO of AMBAC, because for various reasons, AMBAC was very important in New York. And and uh, he has he's worth $16 billion. He didn't need anybody. $16 billion? Yes. Michael Bloomberg. What's the interest on $16 billion, do you think? The interest? Yeah, what's he make on interest? <laughs> Well, I don't know what his returns are, but I got to guess maybe ten percent, a billion six a year. He makes I mean, a that no, at that point the numbers become meaningless, right? That doesn't mean anything anymore. He's just got the craziest. I can amount. tell you, every weekend, given a high pressure job like mayor of New York, every weekend he got in his airplane and went down to his place in Bermuda. He'd leave on Thursday night when he could, unless he had some thing to do like a dinner or whatever, and he'd be back Monday morning. He just take the weekend out of Bermuda. Every weekend he would go down to Bermuda, <laughs> unless you know for other. For, no, but but my point is, you, you got to call your shots. You got to have money in an economy like ours is crucially important. But but where is all that money spent? It's not out bribing people to vote for you. It's out buying FaceTime, yeah, and and um, the technology of the modern media. I've read a lot of pro- proposals to get rid of money in politics, and they were all worse than the cure. Really? Every damn one of them. No, but, 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 but right, I mean, at one point in my life, it, you, you don't even know about this, I was asked to run for political office by the Republican Party in a place we lived. I mean, not necessarily going into the where's and how's and how old I was. And I just looked at the burden that that represented and said, no. I mean, I loved debating all that, but I said, no, I mean... The chances of me winning and then have any having any real influence within the general party structure. Going back to the point I made, if you look, that we're very limited, and, and so I'm going back to the original point. Anybody who wants to be president of the United States and does what you have to do to become president of the United States is a potentially dangerous person because they have to see themselves as George Washington the second or. Um, some major political figure that history will forever recognize. Do you like think Abraham Obama's Lincoln. that way? Yeah, I do. In fact, I've come around to that point. What do you think of him after eight years almost? I'm very disappointed by how far left wing he is. I don't think he understands how the world works the way I thought he did when I made a contribution, by the way, to his campaign in 08. Um, I'm just very disappointed that he thinks to coerce people uh, as diverse and complex as our society is, to coerce them with a bunch of executive orders and uh, using regulatory agencies to, quote-unquote, do good. This is a man whose experience in the world is very narrow and and doesn't really understand how, how the world works. Has he ever had a real job besides being a community organizer or... Not to my knowledge. Or a and professor. There's, there, there, there's very little we know about him. See, I... I, I don't, this is always getting dangerous because the society has become so politically correct. Were it not for his ethnic background, I don't think he ever would have been president. Right. right. That's okay to say. I voted for him for a large part because he was black, and I wanted to send a message to the world that that I'm. I I, I also thought it was a good. I personally wanted young black men and women and children to see that a black. What 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 I I you know what what the potential they what potential they had, I think that's very important. You know I I one of those people who really and I really believe this. I I truly believe that 
I don't care what your color is and I don't care where you're from. I don't care whether you're from the Congo or you're from Ethiopia or you're from China. I, I just think the human mind has, we all have the same potential. I really believe that. And I can prove that. I mean, Jared Diamond, who's coming up on this podcast, spent his life proving that. Um, he answered the question. It's called uh, Yali's question, I think, in Guns, Germs, and Steel, which everybody should read. And w- this guy from Papua New Guinea said, why do you white people have everything and us black people don't have anything? And Jared Diamond took 20 years to answer that question. And it came down to geography. It came down to, um, it came down to access to edible grasses, uh, climate, to... Um, most importantly, to the sharing of ideas. If you were an isolated culture, you stayed isolated. The reason that Europe and things be, be, became what they became was because they shared ideas. They were in proximity with each other. They were always fighting with each other. They, they, they there's a lot of there are a lot of reasons. But I, it's so my my my. I'm not ashamed to admit that I voted for Obama because he was black. I wanted to send a message to the world and. And to say, listen, we're not a prejudiced country if, you, if this is a meritocracy. I thought he was a sensible, smart guy, and I thought that um, he was the best man for the job at the time. I don't believe that anymore, and I, I'm, I'm personally disappointed too. Has nothing to do with whether he's black, and he was half black, by the way. Has nothing to do with any of that. It just I think that he's a good man. I think he's a sensible man. I think he. the problem is he's lived in a theoretical world. He's not a practical guy. And I found it very interesting that so many people vote on, it goes back to you talking about math being the queen of the sciences. So many people voted, and probably myself included, vote based on a feeling. Uh, we look at a guy like Mitt Romney and we go, that guy looks like my boss. I'm not going to vote for him. Uh, or whatever. Or he looks like the Hollywood bad guy. The the powerful tycoon. Fact of the matter is, he's a guy who created a lot of jobs. He's an economic stud, and the economy matters. Maybe the most important thing in the world. And it was just very interesting that we weren't willing to vote somebody into office um, who was really good at economic matters and proved himself in the marketplace. And we voted somebody who did not do that ever, didn't come close to that in the office, uh, Barack Obama. Now, I have a problem with Mitt Romney's social conservatism, and that's part of the reason I couldn't really vote for him. That's why the Republican Party loses me. Well, I would remind you, though, that we vote for somebody's oratory. We have never had a president who has run for office who didn't have an ability to inspire people from the pulpit and many have called Ronald Reagan, for example, called the presidency the bully pulpit. You can the speeches and ideas are very, very important in society over a long period of time. But what you live with is their ability to govern. And the gap in the current case is vast. The the ability of Barack Obama uh, to be an orator is well recognized by everybody. The this giant fraud called the Nobel Prize gave him a Nobel Prize because of his speeches. Speeches, no speech has ever made anybody wealthier except the person speaking being paid by some speaker's bureau. Uh, And so the speeches are what politics are mainly about to get yourself in a position of power. The real important thing is how well you govern. And governing is very complex. There's a lot of detail. And when you try to change the behavior of a nation through coercion in today's world, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. And we have, I'm going to say it again, because I think it's one of the most important points for anybody to focus on. So I'm going to say how dynamic our private sector is, or the world, as Newt Gingrich says, the world that works versus how stagnant the nature of government is. And the factoid here is, we've said it before, let's say it again, if we get people to remember this and start talking about it, it's worthwhile, that in 1955, Fortune Magazine came out with their top 500 corporations. uh, And at that time, everybody, uh, including uh, professors like John Kenneth Galbraith, thought that they ruled the world. Well, in fact, today, so that was John Kenneth Galbraith was a famous economist. Everybody, yeah, he taught at Harvard and all. He was a Canadian guy, uh, and t- 
Today there are about 60 of those top 500 left. I assure you. And the point being? Point being it's very dynamic. That those companies who all thought they were on top of the world, and indeed at the time in 1955 when I was 15 years old, they were on top of the world. Um, and they were kind of running things and employing most of the people. But along came Microsoft, Cisco Systems, Apple. Nobody, Yahoo, nobody had ever heard of such things. They came up with a better product. They came up with a better product, and it was very impersonal. We all said, hey, that Apple iPod, that Apple iPad now, that product, the Cisco, we don't see, but it's all the switching networks. It's everything we take for granted today. Those companies are behind and created. All right, now let's look at the world that doesn't work. Let's look at the world of government, municipal, by the way, state and federal, which spends vast sums to um, eliminate poverty. In fact, if you add it up, they spend $100,000 per family of four who are officially designated impoverished. And we still have poverty as high as we've ever have it, have ever had it in the past. More to the point, we have created bureaucracy and agency after agency after agency, uh, and none of them have ever gone away, and few of them have ever accomplished the task for which they were originally created. And I include the Department of Energy, the Department of Education. Um, what were they? What were the Department of Energy and the Department of Education created for? All right, if we go back to the Carter years, for example. For that matter, Lyndon Johnson, we had speeches, the oratory. By the way, I was out there cheering along with all these people when I was in my 20s. Young and naive. Well, they they expressed the fear that our energy crisis was going to kill the country, that we were were importing more and more energy, that we had 6% of the population consuming 25% of the energy. So they made this into a religious issue religious issue you hear even today in books i've read recently about we have a six percent of the population we consume 25 percent of the energy this is a profligate and evil society which could not be more ridiculous going back to the scientific method couldn't be more ridiculous but this is oratory now carter and other presidents i don't want to pick on anyone said what we need is a department of education because our educational system is not producing the quality of student that we want. What we need is a Department of Energy because government's got to be organized to address and solve the energy problem. Well, find somebody for me today who can say two things. First, that they have accomplished those objectives over the last 40 years. I know I can tell you because I follow these things. They both employ about 220,000 people and spend $25 $25 billion per year. Jesus. And the main issues in our campaigns still are energy, is and energy problems and education problems. Now, let me take this one step further. People will correctly point out, if you want to be a scientist, we are now exporting energy, which no one would ever have guessed 10 years ago. The threat of imports holding us hostage seems to have been eliminated. What has that got to do with the Department of Energy? Virtually nothing. Yet it's, nothing. Yet it's still there. Would nothing. you get? Would you well, get, it will always be there. Would you get rid point. of the Department I of said, Energy? I said 60 are left of the original 500. Of the thousands of government agencies that have been created, how many have ever gone out of business? Don't, don't, don't give it a lot of thought because I've had people working on this issue for a long time. The answer is none. But it's – and again – Let's not get, let me not be uh, accused of what I'm criticizing in the beginning here. It is not evil people in government and good people in the private sector. I've had government people tell me, we've got some incredibly intelligent people in government. Why are you always complaining about them? It is because of the incentive structure that surrounds them. If you suddenly are hired by the Department of Good Feelings or the Department of Good Intentions, which we create, the first thing you want to do is you're not there to work yourself out of a job anymore right. than you are in the private That's sector. Right. And you don't have any competition. No, it's true. So all you've got to you're do is get to your to particular congressman they, and they, say, you know, because, look, if we suddenly create a Department of Good Feelings, 
you are not going to worry about that day in and day out. When the subject's being debated, you are going to say, and all the people listening to us are going to say, what a bad idea, what a bad idea. But let's say it gets created. Is there anybody in their daily lives who's going to say, this is a terrible idea, we've got to destroy this department? They've got other things to do. They have lives. But those same people will stop buying the product of a company that's been outcompeted. That's right. And it's a very impersonal kind of thing. So let me try to summarize this because we've been carrying on here. Once a government department is created, the people who want it to continue and to grow it and grow it and increase its income, by the way, it's now higher than the private sector, the wealthiest communities in the country being around Washington, D.C., and we lived in one for about 10 years in Montgomery County in Maryland, uh, nobody ever intended for that to happen. Uh, but you are an employee now, and you want to keep it going. And all you have to do is get to your congressperson. That's all you have to do. On the other hand, if you're working for a private corporation that's trying to convince people every day to vote in favor of you rather than somebody else, those people out there are buying and making their buying you decisions. Got it. That's, that's like quick car companies. In I mean, a long time, yeah. yeah. Imagine if we had never let Japanese cars into this country. Imagine what we'd be driving. Shitty cars. Death traps. Yeah. Because General Motors, good guys, General Motors. I used, I knew them well. A good guy, but they were, they were producing a product which incentive was structure. It goes crap. back to. Well, here's 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 my question. We've you've talked about this many times, and and and, and I'm glad you're talking about it again because I never get tired of listening to it because I think people should hear it. So you've brought up these points. I want to know how in the world we fix that. How do we make government smaller? And I, by government smaller, I'm not even talking about government smaller. I'm talking about how do we get special interests groups how do we get these lobbyists how do we do all how do we get rid of this issue where government has become an economy of influence and it's consuming so much of our tax base and and taxing us this much without without giving us the results we're looking for what's the best way to do it lawrence lessig wrote a book called republic lost he had one idea he said all that matters is campaign finance reform and you should just start the debate there get money out of politics somehow because if somebody feels like they are politicians are going to listen to the people that get give them money because that's how they stay elected it's human that's how a little bit you, like writing a book that would say let's get know. rid of let's get rid of illness i know well no he was very good the book is very good because i'm he, sure it is he, he breaks it down and stuff and easy yeah. but, but 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 i mean this is my question to you it's one thing to complain about it. it's another thing to come up with a solution what okay, would you I do? have a huge I have a huge program in my head, and I'm not going to suffer your people with it. I'm just going to make a couple of important points about how it would work. And the first thing, if I were king of the world, yeah. king, let's say king of the United States, um, let's take mortgage deduction of mortgage interest, uh, which creates an environment that distorts the marketplace. Government does that all the time because they know better than the people out there that make daily buy and sell decisions. I would not have mortgage interest deducted. However, because it has become so much a part of our current economic structure, I would phase it out over 30 years, not 20, 30 years. Okay. But I would write it into law. And, and it, it, there, there would be no way you could change that 30 years without a two-thirds a majority of both houses of Congress. It would be as difficult to change that as to have a new amendment to the Constitution, which is justifiably very, very difficult, by the way. Then I would means test all entitlements, and I would do that over 20 years. You don't need 30 years for that. What I mean by that is I am fortunately well off. I should not be receiving Social Security, but I do. Your mother is receiving Social Security, has never worked a day in her life. Good woman, all that. She doesn't. Um, I should not be getting Medicare coverage. I should be permitted because of my income and wealth level to go out there and fend for myself. So as soon as you do what we have done with Medicare, Social Security, these are not, these are good programs, something of that kind I support for people who are less well off. But as soon as you get somebody like me and people even uh, less well off than I am benefiting from these programs, you make it almost impossible to change them. 
Because people want to hold on to them. Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not against government benefits when they're for me. Yeah, it's exactly. only when they're for other people. That's right. So, but that's, so, so you make it when, when when we make these dumb decisions in moments of passion, after a State of the Union address about this great society and so forth. Some of these intensely stupid things we've done, supported by media people that never go beyond rhetoric. That's what their lives are: is rhetoric. You once told me about people in show business, and you said they're they're. They live in emotional worlds, not in rational worlds. They don't show do business. I, as I get older, they get they solve problems. Though I mean, the way you get a movie done is you're solving a thousand problems a day. And, and but Hollywood is a very, very run very efficiently. I respect Hollywood more than a lot of what I suppose some would yep. call me a right winger. It's not, really, not really good. I support it Hard because people. because it is so competitive. Yep. I love it. So when the final product comes out of the end of the sausage machine. Yep. Um, it is something that's gone through a set of tests no government program ever has right. to go through. That's right. Right? Yeah. I just wish you would do much better. Hey, man. Hey, man. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hey, that's outrageous. You are my son. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Hold the, hold the mic up to your face, for God's no, sake. No, I, I didn't want to. No, I understand. My muttering. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. No wonder I'm so insecure. No wonder I have a hole I can't fill. Now, uh, let me ask you this. We've got to wrap this up, but, uh, but keep going with, with what else you would do if you were king of the world. I would um, eliminate things like the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and energy. And again, and again, one of the reasons it's difficult to even get started on this is because the government's gotten so big and broad that even to get into a significant amount of conversation about it, you've got to have a week-long workout session. And Romney, by the way, did this, but every political candidate who did these things got nowhere with it because people don't have the attention span. And it doesn't mean people are dumb. It just means they have their own lives. They got shit to you know, do. They're skiing like we did today, and they're playing with their grandchildren, which I love more than anything else I can think of. But if, if you take, and I've mentioned this on this podcast, and I just want people to hear it again because they're just... Trust me once, there are a thousand examples of what I'm about to give you, but I think this one is the most egregious of all. Um, and I can give you five, but we don't have the time. But the one I think is, is the most incredible is there is, a, there is a section of the Health and Human Services Department in uh, Washington that spends approximately $18 billion a year. I'm not... I'm not up to date in the recent budget. I can tell you, it's not gotten smaller. And a billion dollars is a, a million, million. A thousand I mean, a thousand million, million dollars, million. everybody. It's so a thousand there, million dollars. I mean, if you stack uh, $1 bills on top of each other to a billion, it's way higher than the tallest billing. But so, I mean, it's immense amounts of money. It all eventually comes out of the taxpayers. And it's all about the reason Obama says we need more taxes. So we, we can put more money into the world that doesn't work, by the way. Anyway, they spend this large amount of money with a lot of bureaucrats uh, creating and implementing programs to get people to stop smoking. Now, the number of people that no longer that have stopped smoking is immense. I mean, that's one of these things like drunk driving, right? Society as a whole by itself can get fed up with something, and you don't need the government. They just will stop smoking. Yeah. When you see somebody when the now, you say, what a weirdo, there. they're smoking. When I was your age, everybody yeah, smoked. When, they, when the information is out there, people go, I don't want to die of cancer. Okay, well, they spend, they spend a lot of money at the federal government level to get people to stop smoking. And I'll guarantee you, just by the way, if everybody in this country stops smoking, those guys are not going away. They're going to continue to spend this money to get people to stop smoking, but they'll rephrase some of the language to keep people from not restarting the smoking habit, yeah. that yeah. type of thing. Yeah. And I don't know. Let's just take one second. You know what the, one of the biggest problems they had when they first started this back? Oh, I think it was probably the Carter administration. We're going to get people to stop smoking and start this whole thing. They started putting out monetary incentives, and what happened is the number of people who – started to smoke or didn't stop smoking when they intended to increase. So the number of smokers went up. The tobacco companies loved it. Because, because, because the government came out and said, we're going to pay you. To stop we're smoking. going to give you a tax deduction as of next January 1st. Because, and, you know, it takes time to set up the program, get Congress to approve it. We're, we're gonna, so we can't get this started until January 1st. Well, here we are now in 2014 in the early part. You're going to stop smoking. But... If you stop smoking after next January 1st, you're going to get a tax deduction. So that's a beautiful excuse to continue smoking for another year. 
you know, this is this is going on all the time. But nevertheless, Man. this this organization exists. Now, we could get in a taxi cab, but it's too close. The taxi driver would be very, very upset. So I'm going to uh, take you down to the Department of Agriculture, and I'm going to take you up on a floor. I even think I remember the floor where there is there are a bunch of bureaucrats spending mucho billions of dollars subsidizing tobacco farmers in the south this is the same explain what you mean by subsidizing tobacco they pay tobacco farmers to keep growing tobacco they pay them they pay them they give them transfer growing tobacco we do that with a lot of crops that is the department of agriculture don't don't we do that with corn and and dairy and everything (laughs) else look, look again step two steps back Agricultural prices in this country have been declining ever since, every year since World War II. And I see absolutely no reason that shouldn't continue because of the technology, the increased product production, and so forth. Everything the Department of Agriculture has done has had nothing to do with that outcome. But when they created the Department of Agriculture, that was perceived that we had a serious food problem in this country and the people were going to start starving to death. Okay, now what's happened is we have the family farm no longer exists. They're all corporate farms. Family farmers have come into the urban environment. They don't try to produce crops anymore. Uh, that there's it's, there's it's a, a reverse trend on that with farmers it's markets. A, it's a like government. That. It's a government industry. Yeah, just it's like a, they're trying to make health. It is a socialized <laughs> industry. Huge amounts of money are poured into it. And by the way, the problem went away decades ago. If we have anything, if you look the at the pandemic, the food problem of a shortage. If you look, at, if you look around the country at the pandemic uh, obesity problem, yeah. tell me we have a food shortage. If anything, it's gotten, it's put money, it's gotten people fatter because there's more money in growing corn and shitty foods that are, aren't. Do you use language like that on, on my podcast? podcast. Okay. I like to keep it edgy. Yeah, that's how I keep things edgy. Um, so the point is, you have a government that nobody designed subsidizing with your money people who grow tobacco, and you have a government that is trying to stop people from using the product. Does that make any sense if Franklin D. Roosevelt came back from his grave and saw so many examples of that? Let's just take one more very quick one, okay? Because where the origin of all this goes comes. Uh, <clears throat> we have alpaca farmers alpaca farmers. Yeah, you, told, you talked about this. Yeah, well, I think it's very important. We're paying alpaca, alpaca farmers. farmers. will subsidize $100 million a year. They have an average net worth of over a million dollars, and they are subsidized $100 million a year because they used to go into military uniforms, and it started during the Korean War. We've got rid of alpaca military uniforms forever. Guess what? Subsidy is still there. And just try to get rid of it. The alpaca farmers have a vested interest. They spend a lot so of time. So you'd also, as the emperor, we got to go to dinner. Uh, as the emperor, you'd get rid of alpaca farmers and you'd sh- phase out all that all that subsidizing. Well, anyway, I really appreciate these conversations because they energize me. Good. Uh, we appreciate having you, and I know you're a big uh, fan favorite. So uh, there's Mike Callen, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be in Boston this weekend. Come see me. Laugh Boston, baby. Buy your tickets. Uh, I think it's laughboston.com. Uh, I have never been to the club, but I hear good things. Big Mike, once again, thanks for shedding light on a very important issue. It's really great to have you as a son, Brian. Oh, boy, this is, is good. That, that, that come across is, the way I don't believe you. You're just, no, you're, you're, that's really, it just sounds so, oh, I feel uncomfortable now. God damn it. All right, bye-bye, everybody. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show. Be sure to visit briancallen.com for information about this episode as well as past and future episodes. You can follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Callen and like him on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash Comedy. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.